sweet songs this morning. Um, I'll just call a little bit of audible. Uh, this happens to me most frequently. So um, this, uh, uh, the little uh, contact sheets that you have that are attached to your bulletin, uh, those are a place for you to put uh, your information down uh, to keep us abreast of things. They're there also to give us some some prayer requests, if you have those, we're very interested in those. I'm going to leave, I'm going to ask the ushers to put some uh, uh, plates out at the back so that when you walk out, you can put those in if you didn't get a chance to do that. I'm not trying to get after Grayson here, but that's, that's usually what I do, and Grayson has to clean it up, so it's uh, interesting for me to do that this time. Uh, but if you'll, you'll do that, because we do want to get your prayer uh, requests and down. I wanted to mention on top of that, uh, this was an interesting week for me on many different levels. Um, you know, I've known, I've grown up, and uh, I know Philippians 4.8. I know that verse, um, 4.6 it is, you know, don't be anxious about anything, but in prayer, right, commit these things to the Lord. Uh, you know, it's always astounding to me, it's sad, that it actually works, right? It actually works. I, 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 had, a, I had an episode this, uh, this week where uh, my, I was just really burdened, you know, with a lot of things that are going on in the background of my life. And for some people and some issues that I have to deal with and uh, that are just heavy, uh, the lives of people. Uh, and I, I, was, uh, I, I did it uh, sitting in my car on the way between here and Cedarville. Uh, and while I sat in the parking lot when I got to Cedarville, uh, and I was just praying through the list. Uh, I won't say that I actually read the list while I was driving. Uh, but uh, as I was going through, I was praying the list. And what happened is God drew me out of my own troubles into the troubles of other people. Um, and I had this, I had this almost visceral experience that when I got to Cedarville, I felt physically lighter. Um, I just felt that I had, had taken some things off of my shoulders. Uh, and when I walked in to that morning, I walked in with a real encouragement, uh, because, uh, I had gotten my eyes off of my circumstances and on the God who's over all those circumstances. Uh, and I was not anxious. Uh, it didn't mean that I wasn't still concerned, but uh, there's a difference between anxiety and concern. Anxiety decenters God and centers yourself and tries to figure out how you're going to fix things, right? Concern puts God in his place and tries to figure out what your role is underneath that. So I pray for all of us as you're, some of us are in dark places today with really difficult things that are going on in your life relationally, right? At your work, um, in your families. God doesn't want us to fret and to turn to false saviors. He wants us to turn to him, find the relief we need and the wisdom that we need to love well uh, in hard moments. Uh, and so I want to encourage you to do that. We're in the book of Ephesians. So I want you to open up to Ephesians chapter 2, if you will. And uh, we're working our way through the book of Ephesians. And we've, we've titled it, Enjoying and Proclaiming God's Triumph in Christ by the Spirit. And some of you say triumph. If you look through the book of Ephesians, you'll see the language of Christ triumphing at the end of chapter 1. You'll see him triumphing at the beginning of chapter 2. Uh, everyone who's been rescued by Jesus has been delivered from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. So God has conquered those threats against us. You're going to find in chapter 4 that Jesus takes captivity captive at the beginning of chapter 4. And as he takes captivity captive, captivity captive is that it's translated there then he gives gifts to men so out of his victory comes uh his largesse and then when we get to chapter six which is very familiar right we're talking about being warriors in a battle and we need to put some armor on right so this language of god triumphing and this language goes back right to uh the old testament imagery of god as this warrior who comes to defend and free his people well, all those images of God the warrior defending and freeing his people, they all coalesce, they all come together in Jesus as the warrior, the consummate warrior who does everything that's necessary to free us from the consequences of our sin, to bring us out from under uh, the control of the evil one, which we willingly accede to because our heart is his. And so Jesus is the victor, right? He accomplishes the victory and we get to participate in it. So God's triumph in Christ. And as we've looked at it here, we've tried to describe it. Let's see here. I'm trying to move forward. I am turned on. Um, okay, there we go, right? So the very first uh, chapter in 1, 3 through 14, he gives us an overview of God's plan to bring all things to their appointed end for the praise of his glory in Christ through the Spirit. That's the big plan in 1, 3 through 14. 
And then he says, he wants Paul, Paul wants us to relate the universe-encompassing scale of the salvation plan of God to the experience of the believers as individuals in community. Now, what I'm going to say this over and over again is that for most of us, the major problem that we have is our God is too small. Our God is too small. We read a passage like Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, or we hear Jesus say something which just sounds like, okay, Jesus, that's a nice metaphor, like the meek will inherit the earth. Now, that's a nice metaphor. We're going to do well, people want to say. No, no, Jesus means that literally. He means that literally, that there will be a time when he establishes rule and reign, that he will rule and reign over the whole earth with his people, establishing peace and justice. So it's, he doesn't mean that as just, a, you know, things are going to turn out well in the end. And so for often, right, one of the biggest problems we have when we have problems is the problem is way bigger than the God who handles them. And so we turn to other things to try to get us out from under the pressure, right? We distract ourselves with entertainment. We turn to the bottle or to a needle, Right? We turn to pornography, we turn to all kinds of false saviors because our God isn't big enough to get us out of it. And the scriptures are full of God's people hearing God's promises and then when they don't get fulfilled the way they think they should or within a time scale that they think they should, they, they try to help out God by doing something alongside, which it always turns out bad. Right? It always turns out bad. So he wants to get that, and he, so he wants them to get inside the truth of just who God is and what he has been and is up to in Christ through the Spirit and so that they can be freed from their fears and freed to enjoy and proclaim God's triumph. Right? That's what God wants to do for us every day. He wants to free us from our fears. Right? Um, there are a lot of scary things going on in our culture right now, uh, even besides COVID. A lot of scary things that are going on. And people are afraid. Uh, and you have some people, just because of COVID, who have not been out of their houses basically since COVID came. They're in fear. They're upset. They're angry. Right? They're in despair. And every time it seems like we're going to get past this thing, somebody says, well, we need a new mandate. Right? If we lived in Australia today, which I'm glad I don't, but I pray for the Christians in Australia, it's a really strange place right, about what's going on. I'm not going to tell you about the news there, but it's a place where people are being arrested and put in their homes and marked and followed uh, because they're trying to get to the point where there's absolutely no COVID cases in the whole country. And the country gets locked down when one person gets COVID, right? And I mean locked down. I mean like locked in your house down, right? So those kinds of moments, it's causing all kinds of distress in people, emotional, mental distress, People are being separated from each other. Physical contact has gone wanting, right? Children live who can't process it the way you do as adults. They live in constant fear that something out there is stalking them to kill them, right? Down the road, we'll be talking about the impact of COVID on our little children, right, in 10 to 15 years, right, in terms of that. So we live in that moment, and Paul once said, we need to get inside of the God who saved us of his program in Christ so that we can be free from fear, or as Jesus would say, we don't fear what other people fear, and so that we can be free to enjoy his triumph. And so as we've looked at it, what we've looked at here is we found out that the book is divided in basically two different sections. In the first three chapters, and this is interesting for Paul, he's going to spend three chapters just telling us about this triumph of God in Christ. There's really no direction in the first three chapters to do something. It's all about what's happened. It's just a description, right, that we're supposed to enjoy. And it's only until we get the big picture that we're ready in chapters 4, 5, and 6 then to be instructed because the only way we're ever going to have 4, 5, and 6 is if we get inside the truth of what God has done in Christ, right? Grayson was talking about the challenge that we have to be united, right? And if we've, if we, I can't think of a more divisive moment than the one we've been in the United States and how that is penetrating the church, right, in terms of divisions, right? It's hard. It's hard to get along with people. The, the American church in particular, because of the abundance of churches, is just marked by people who regularly split off from each other, right? If you could take, to, to my chagrin, right, to the sadness, right, and, and there's all kinds of different reasons that we might talk about it, but if you could take the churches in this area, the churches in this area that people could go to, right, with a decent drive, if you could get the people, and you could follow all the people who've switched around to all the different churches, it would look like the phone lines in New York City, right? It'd be so complex and so many travels, people going here, there, back, forth, up and down, and why do they leave? They can't get along with the people at a different place. 
right? Now, there's different reasons for different ones. I don't want to put them all in the same bucket, for, but for the vast majority of among all those churches, one thing I do know is that nobody left because the churches are not preaching the gospel. I know that nobody left because they don't believe in the exclusivity of Jesus, nor do I think that they differ any distinctive way doctrinally, and almost every one of the moves have to do with personal, interpersonal issues where people don't get along with each other. Now, that's a discussion to have, and I'm not putting everybody in the same bucket, so don't hear me say more than I'm saying. I'm just saying the fact is, is that in America, when tensions come between a brother and sister, whether they blow up on Facebook, whether they blow up in a conversation, whether they blow up because you hear about somebody else, the default move of so many people is to hang there for a little while, and then when they don't address it or don't deal with it, they just move on, right? And so we can make it up by just going down the road. Well, if we were in Somalia today, maybe, or in a place where the only church in town was the one we go to, uh, it might be a lesser option, right? But here, he's going to talk about all these resources have, been, uh, have happened by God in Christ to help people to love each other, right? Help husbands and wives to stay married. Help families to stick together. Help churches to love each other and represent the unity that God makes possible in Christ. And then chapters 4 through 6, well, how do we live that out? Well, we talk in a certain way. We make unity a primary goal, right? That's the very first thing he's going to talk about in chapter four. We have characteristics of people who've been changed. We have different kinds of marriages. We see men who treat their wives the way Christ treats the church. We see wives responding to their husbands in ways that are shocking. We see parents uh, uh, praying and laboring to introduce their children to Christ and to live uh, as Christ before them, right? All those type of things we see if we see the people of God. Now, this first section, and you can see where we're underlined, this is where we're going to be today. So, the enjoying God's triumph in one through three, one, uh, the first one, praising God for his loving provision that comes to his people according to his sovereign plan in Christ by the Spirit in one, three through 14, then prayer for insight to get a hold of that, to live into it, and then to detail the outworking of that plan. So, now we're going into the details. Well, last week we talked about new life in Christ this week, we're going to talk about a new community in Christ, right? So we'll talk about that. All right, this is ours. Uh, we already said it. I was going to say it with you, but we've already said it already. But this is our, this is our um, um, uh, memory verse, and I hope you are memorizing them as you go along. This is our memory verse. Um, but what I want to say here, particularly today, just as I have that up here, it's because of this that the rest of this passage in verses 11 through 22 are possible. It's because of this that it's demanded by God. Because if you have believed in Jesus Christ, you're different. You have been fundamentally changed. You have new resources. You have new uh, desires. You have a new potential because you've been changed. And only because of 2.10 could Paul even talk about 2.11 through 22, but that's the precursor that everyone in this room who's believed in Jesus Christ, you used to be a zombie, right? You were alive, you were the walking dead. You were estranged from God and cut off from him, and you were in league with the evil one because that's just by nature who you were. So you were in league with, and so you gave in to your desires, and you lived out whatever way seemed right for you, and then God in his mercy broke in in Christ when, when a Sunday school teacher told you about Jesus, when your mom or your grandmother or your dad told you about Jesus, or somebody invited you to church and said, would you come and hear about Jesus? And all of a sudden, in that moment, God's mercy poured out into your life through Jesus and made you alive and to, made you someone who enjoyed your relationship with Christ, and you came to life. And now you've been made something new, and God has prepared beforehand to do great things in and through your life. And that's who you are. Now, that's why we can talk about the next verses and say that it's not only that God brought you to himself. He not only fi fixed the horizontal relationship, right, that you're estranged from him. He's made it possible to fix these relationships, right? These, okay? And I want to say what Paul's going to say, there's no one who's rightly related to God who's treating their brothers and sisters badly. You get me? 
There's no, you, 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 there's no such thing as a lone ranger for Jesus in Paul's world. In all the scripture, you've not been brought to God and then you just get to do what you do, right? And so I had, I, I told you this story before. I had a man at one time that was associated with this church that I was visiting him in his home and he was sitting there in his uh, uh, lazy boy. It was a leather one, I think. And I was talking to him and he, told, he looked at me and he said, Greg, why do I need to come to Emmanuel? I can sit right here in front of my TV set and I can get better preaching than I'm going to get at Emmanuel. Why do I need to get up? I'm comfortable right here. Why do I need to go out and do that? And I said, well, that really depends on uh, what, it, what you think God requires of you and what he's made possible and whether or not that's being faithful to Jesus. So I don't want to talk about what's happening in Emmanuel. I just want to talk about whether you think that's being faithful to what Christ has died to make happen in your life. That's where the discussion went. And so there's something wrong, right, uh, with a believer who says, you know, I love Jesus, I love him, but his people, I can't take them. I can't take them. Or I just like to go to his people and, 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 you know, almost if we could have an interview with Jesus and say, you know, Jesus, great job on recruiting this one. Great job on recruiting this one. But, but seriously, Jesus, this one, are you kidding me? They're embarrassing. They don't read the right things. Do you know how they talk? They don't care about the right things. Right? They, they lean a little bit left politically. God, can you do something deeply in them? Something. God, uh, come on. Are you sure? Right? I, okay, okay, Jesus, you bringing them here. I guess I'm going to have to go find the group of the people that more fit me. So I'm going to move over to them. And Jesus said, no, 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 this is my family. It's your job to make it work. And I'm saying, okay, but no. Right? So what we do usually is we don't say that deliberately to Jesus. Like, I, I haven't had a conversation with Jesus. Like, Jesus, this group is too, you know, age, stage diverse. It's too socioeconomic diverse. It's too this. It really just kind of bugs me. I just want Christians who like to read books and drink nice coffee. Right? That's what I want. I want to hang out with them. I want to go to coffee shop and talk about, you know, important things, right? I, I just don't want to mess with these other things. So I'm going to start me a church or find me a church that has that kind of thing. Now, I'm not going to say that deliberately, right? I'm not going to look for that in my list. But, but the way I behave, it's really that I, I just don't want to put up with these family members, right? So like every one of us in our, our, our biological families, we've got the crazy uncle, right? Or the, or the weird aunt, right? Or the people who come from that state over there, and when they show up, when you were a teenager, you were gone, and you remember your mom going that, now, now, Greg, you be friendly. You go talk to so-and-so, right? Go do that. And I'm going, Mom, you don't understand, right? You don't understand how these people, we're going to spend our day away from those people, okay? Now, I'm speaking about all these human dynamics, and what we're going to find here is what Paul's going to say is that God has done something so deep and so profound. We are family, whether or not we recognize it or not. We are family. Whether you recognize it or not is a matter of you living into the reality that God has already created because we don't create the family. The family is already made. And we've been empowered to live as the family. And we have the resources that, to live as that family. And he says, now you make it work, right? And I know I've joked with you about that before, is that when you were born into your biological family, your parents never conferred with you about whether or not you should get another brother or sister, Right? And then after that brother or sister grew up, you were really mad with them because they should have conferred with you and you're ready to unadopt them at any moment, right? Uh, because they're a pain in the butt. They jump mess in your stuff or right, they, they suck the air out of the room or they're whatever, okay? And so in, in our family, one of our favorite memories is little Victoria looking at little Dominique as she was coming in as a baby into our family and looking at her as we're putting her in the van and saying, I don't want her, <laughs> right? And I just said to honey, that's not a choice you get to make, mm. right? She just little mm, sat there in the, in the van all the way home, did not care that that baby was in that seat, was upset about that baby being in that seat. And I'm telling you, as adults, sometimes I don't want him. Mm. I don't want her, mm. right? God, put her back in the van and drive her over to First Baptist somewhere, <laughs> right? So that's the idea, right, of where we get is, is we want to say, I don't want you. I don't want your background and the junk you bring in you, the background. I don't want the, the, the debris you carry in from your past. I don't want those things. I want people that are not so messy, right, as if you're not messy, right? 
So those are the kind of things. So because you're this kind of person, God says something can happen, real. Okay, now I want to read this passage to you. And so uh, you can stay seated here, but let's read it. We're going to read it all the way through, 11 to 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Move forward here. All right. Uh, by the blood of Christ, I'll find my space here where I just left. Uh, where did I just end? 14, thank you, honey. Uh, 14. Um, uh, set aside. Uh, well, uh, uh, for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and he preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. All right, now as we come to this passage, right? I was thinking about this week, and already I'm getting hot, so I'm sorry, I'm going to take this off. Um, I was thinking about this week, and I, 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 after I wrote them out to myself, I almost sat down because I was depressed, right? So here's what I wrote out to myself this week. Our society is in turmoil. The contributing factors are almost too many to list. The loss of life due to the COVID pandemic and the reduction of all of life to avoiding or fighting it. The dispiriting chaos and tragic loss of life that marked the withdrawal from Afghanistan, not to mention the human tragedy unfolding for the Afghani people, especially for Afghani Christians, as the Taliban takes the reins of power. The polarized and mean-spirited political scene. The vitriol and passion directed against any attempt to put any limitation on a mother's ability to kill her unborn, unborn child. Right? I've seen some real passion this week directed by people who are so upset that there might be any limitation on the ability of someone to kill a child. The daily obvious and, uh, and, and, not, and uh, not so obvious uh, tragedy uh, unfolding on our southern border. I tried to avert my eyes from this, uh, and I, I, I looked into it and was trying to figure out what was going on and why some people were so passionate about it. And when I saw it, I saw the inhumane conditions with dead bodies floating in the water or littering the landscape at people's ranches, children and pregnant women. And then the hidden tragedies that speak of it, the, sex, the sex and drug trafficking, the rape of women and girls, the abuse of desperate people by cartels which control the Mexican borders, the abandonment of children and the elderly, the loss of safety, property, and a way of life for ranchers and landowners at the border. It's a very, very dark thing. School board meetings, right? We've seen those. School board meetings exploding as educators and administrators are called out for pitting races against each other or normalizing, yes, normalizing pedophilia or dissolving gender into a fluid whatever the child thinks they are today concept and forcing women to compete with men and to allow men into their bathrooms. And all of this is happening on the national level and the state level, right? Right? We still have the normal stresses of life. Some of you are overwhelmed by the normal things that are going on. So I haven't got time for all the mess on the big scene. And so what happens then is we just live in this moment where it seems like this kind of noxious fog is just hanging over us right in this moment. 
And so even if we're not caught up in the big things, they drift in and out of our lives uninvited, right? They filter into our conversations and practices in our workplace, right? I've had conversations with, uh, with people who are trying to figure out, do I take the vaccine or not? This is going to cost me a job. Should I take it, pastor? Right? So I had a, had a former student write me and say, you know, I, I'm thinking as a nurse if I should take this vaccine or not. And if I don't take this vaccine, it's not just that I'll lose my job. I don't know if my family can afford the loss financially, Right? And so what would you recommend that I do? Right? So she didn't wake up and think about that, but now it's in her daily weekend. She's got a difference of opinion among her colleagues, and she's even got a difference of opinion within her home between her and her husband. So they have different assessments of the significance of the things that are going on and the way we should respond to them are fracturing friendships. Some of you are just saying, oh, come on. Just let that stuff go. And other people are saying, you need to pay attention to it. And just because this one's not paying attention to it and this one is, they can't talk to each other anymore. In addition, these issues with the tensions they cause, they float right into the church. They poison the atmosphere and strain relationships. Some Christ followers are simply overwhelmed and discouraged and say, shut up, don't talk to me about those things. I want to go out and enjoy the fall, right? Others have become combatants fighting each other about how a Christ follower should uh, respond. And many of us, we just vacillate between the poles, depending on what happens. The impact on these events on the church has the fingerprints here that we're learning of the evil one. Right, This this has the fingerprints. You know what the book of Ephesians, if I just tell it here, it's the reverse, if you're familiar with the screw tape letters, it's the reverse of the screw tape letters. Right, the screw tape letters is C.S. Lewis's attempt to try to describe what the evil one does. This, on the other hand, is Paul saying, this is what God does through the Spirit, and so you can infer that everything that goes against what I'm teaching you here is the work of the evil one. So what does God do? We're going to find this. Everything that's characteristic of God is that he breaks down walls of hostility between opposed groups. He gives them unity in Christ, and everything that speaks of God is harmony and oneness and flourishing. That's why in chapter 4, he's going to say there's one God, one faith, one spirit, one, 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 one. If you don't get that, you've missed something, right? Because that's just what he does. He unites husbands and wives. He unites people in a family. He unites congregations. He works at people who cross political divides. He does those things, right? That's what he does. And so you can infer that everything the evil one does is what does he do? He divides. He brings hostility. He creates enmity, Right? You remember that little phrase from Titus? I've been thinking about this all week. I think Steve was the one that talked about it, that Paul described this in Titus chapter 3, that formerly we used to be people who were hated and hated one another. He makes lovers out of haters. That's what God does. So that drifts in. So the impact then is makes people think right in this moment that two things I think always in crisis is that God isn't in control And maybe his ultimate triumph is in jeopardy. I'm reading about all this flowery stuff in the book of Ephesians, and I'm wrestling to love the person who sits across from me in this auditorium. I'm struggling to love the person I disagree with in my family. I'm struggling to to view other people in other churches who take different stances on these social issues as even my brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? So, okay, I hear you. I hear you, right? I hear all this flowery language in the book of Ephesians. Something really powerful must have happened. And what the book of Ephesians says, something really powerful did happen. It did happen. And so we begin to doubt whether his triumph was there. And so then we begin to look to other groups to help us figure it out. So why not look to some other group or movement, right, to figure it out? Why not trust the loudest, boldest, angriest voices that have the endorsement of our culture, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's amazing to me how many people take seriously what our actors and actresses say about these issues. Or athletes, right? And again, I'm not against any of those people in particular, but I'm seeking some careful treatment for my wife, uh, for my wife, take that away, for my mother at this moment uh, because of of a physical illness. And you know who I'm not consulting? I'm not consulting actresses or actors. And I'm not consulting athletes. Why? Because are they bad people? No, they're fine people, but they don't know anything about medicine any more than I do. What am I consulting? A specialist, right? We have this thing which psychologists call a halo effect, that when somebody's successful in one area, we give them authority in all areas, 
right? Well, they don't have authority in those areas, but man, they become the voices that we follow and say, well, so-and-so said this, well, it's got to be important. Why? Because, daggone it, have you not seen him play basketball? And I'm saying I have, but what still, what does that have to do with it? Have you not seen her in that latest movie? Yeah, really good. But what does that have to do with She even played a doctor in that movie. Okay, all right, I'm with you, right? Uh, we listen to key politicians, social media influencers, TV and radio commentators, grievance and advocacy groups, hipster religious authorities, right? And then we ask ourselves, why not see the cultural path of least resistance as the right path? Or as Sarah, right, turned to Hagar to help God out when his plan obviously wasn't working. You remember Sarah? Right? Oh God, God, look at Abraham, it ain't happening. Right, look at me, it ain't happened. I guess I got to figure it out on my own, God. And then she figured it out on her own and screwed up everything historically forever. Right? So there's Sarah, right? For those who think uh, this way, it seems that the church uh, as it has, does, just doesn't work. You get a lot of people saying the church is behind the times, the church is not responding to this rightly, the church needs to get into the discussion. Right, the church, and again, there may be reasons for all those things, but usually it's a precursor to saying, I'm going to kick God and his prescription aside so that I can run with this group. So the evil one wants to undermine the mission of the people of God by turning his people away from him in frustration, or let me put it this way, in embarrassment, and get us to turn against each other. Right? So he wants to do that. So when, Paul, when the church came into existence, what I want to tell you here, it's nothing new what we're facing here, right? What he's dealing with is some of the oldest, most ancient hostilities he's writing between Jews and Gentiles, which is even, as far as many Gentiles are concerned, an offensive way to speak about the nature of what constitutes humanity, right? Because it's Jews and everybody else, right? Well, those Gentiles were a diverse group of people, to use our contemporary terminology, Right? So there's Jews, that's a very small minority, and then the rest of humanity, well, those are all just Gentiles. And then, of course, for the Jews, one of their favorite words for the Gentiles is just a whole bunch of Gentile kunos, dogs. Just filthy curs. Useless people. Right? So you got Jews and Gentiles. Now, all of a sudden, they're all confessing Christ. They're walking into the same house church. It's probably even not nearly as big as our own building right here. More intimate, knowing, like walking into a small group. They walk in there, and now they hated each other. They used to despise each other. The Jew would not even sit with them, certainly not have table fellowship with them, right? All those kind of things like that, they may tolerate them, but now they're supposed to call each other brothers and sisters. Oh, my goodness. Right? And there's still all the other tensions are there. The rich, poor, right? The powerful, the powerless. Those are all still going on class and race distinctions, right? And even among different groups, even among the Gentiles, there's more valued groups and less valued groups, right? And Paul will say some of those like Scythian and barbarian, right? The barbarians, the people who are just uncouth and culturally out of touch with things. The Scythian, violent people, right? right? Really just uh, considered less than human. Right? Now you're sitting right next to them. You used to structure your whole life to stay in your little group and to keep climbing higher into the other groups. And now all of a sudden you're with a bunch of losers on the cultural sense. Okay? So all the tensions here, Paul, there's nothing new. And here he's just talking about the dynamics within the walls, let alone all the crazy things that were going on by the Roman government and the local government. And there was a lot of crazy things going on in the ancient world. Right? And they had a lot more power, right? Um, just one of the key dynamics behind the book of Romans, for example, is Claudius just decides he's tired of the Jews because they're fighting over Jesus and the claims of the gospel, and he just kicks all the Jews out of Rome. Right? Well, then that just upends everybody's life. They lose all their property. Everything changes, right? That's the ancient world in which we're in. So Paul's not writing to some Shangri-La moment. And so when people say, I just wish we could go back to the first century church, right? I say, which one and at what moment and what exactly do you want to pick from that first century church? Because their fallen group of people on the way who've been redeemed by Christ, they had the same issues that we have today. Same issues and deep, hard issues, right? So we come to this passage and what we want to dig into here is we want to see it has three moves. He's going to talk about the past reality, God's answer for that past reality, and what Christ did, right? And that third one is going to undergird, right, everything that he says in the first two. 
Okay? So he's going to describe really what Christ did. And notice, it's not telling us what to do. It's just telling us what already happened. What already happened? What has been done to create this new group of people? Right? And I, I, I use this phrase over and over again. Is there are more real, lasting, true bonds between me and anyone in this room who confesses Jesus Christ than there is between me and my nearest blood relative who rejects Jesus. Okay? My family, in a real sense, and this is the language of Jesus, when you step away from those who reject me and you step into belief in me, you join a new family. A new family, right? And for some of us, our whole biological family is in the new family. But for many of us, some of our biological family is in the new family. And some of those maybe sometimes right under our roof are not in that new family. I talk to students all the time at Cedarville who are coming to Cedarville and their whole family has nothing to do with Jesus. And number one, they don't understand why they're coming to Cedarville anyway, why Jesus has to be so important to their education. Why they want to come to this school when they can get a better degree at some, you know, state you here or there. And this student's desire to put Christ at the center of the life of their mind, they just don't get it. Sometimes they're supportive, sometimes not. But it doesn't make sense because they're not a part of Christ's family. So the issue here is he's going to talk about what you, we used to be. And here it's going to talk on the level of interpersonal relationships what God's answer is in verse 13, and then what Christ did. So let's look at the first one, okay? And I hope it comes out well enough here. But this first one is in verses 11 and 12. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and so called uncircumcision by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at one time, right, you were estranged from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. Now, I tried to do a little color coding here to tie those things together, and that red color didn't come out very well. But there's, there's, there's a, you can see six things here that used to be characteristic of who we were before we came to Christ. We had no peace, and this is the fundamental one. And what he means by peace here is not an absence of hostility, Right? Everyone who's been married knows the kind of peace that's an absence of hostility. Okay? That's one where you're just not talking to each other. Right? Now, I know that's never happened to any of you, so I can describe it to you, and you can maybe get inside it from the outside, right, if you're a married person, right? You have a difference of opinion, which Ron and I have never had one. Just want to make that clear. We've never had a difference of opinion over anything that really mattered, and uh, we have a discussion. All of a sudden, it blows up. And then we know it's not good for us to keep trying to go after it, so we just shut up. But it doesn't mean that we're now flourishing as a couple. No, we're just in our corners stewing, right? And even sometimes I say it to my shame, I'm figuring out different ways that I can kind of punish Rana and stick it to her through the day, right? I know you guys have never done that, but I'll just confess it, right, to you, right? One of these type of things where I know something's coming up or whatever, and I know how not to do something without being clear so that just to irritate her, right? So it's sad that that's even in my soul, but it's there, right? So it's a peace that means an absence of conflict, right? I've seen the absence of conflict in people driving to church on Sunday morning, that kind of peace. Nobody's talking to each other. Nobody's looking at each other. The car is quiet, but man, is it awkward in there, you got the same kind of peace that happens at the church pew. People are here. You're sitting over here and you're sitting over here, right? And we're adults in here. I have, I have hardly ever, there's maybe been one chance where I've seen, you know, two Christians who disagree with others start to throw down out in the lobby, right? Seen, you know, sister so-and-so tackle brother so-and-so and they're going at it, right? Jerry Springer, right? Christian style, right? We're looking out there and we're going, whoa, what's going on? Oh, go fight, 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 right? No, I've never seen that happen. Right? We're more sophisticated. We just avoid each other. We just don't talk to each other, right? We're careful, that going, and I want to get caught in the same group with that people. Man, alive, oh, that's close. Don't want to do that. Man, alive, I don't want to have to talk to them. Maybe we avoid the class that they're in. Maybe we avoid youth groups so we don't have to go, right? All those kind of things like that. All of a sudden, there's, the peace is there is the absence of conflict, not the presence of real flourishing. This peace 
is, is both the absence of real flourishing and the presence of conflict. But what, what Paul is going to say, what Christ does, is he not only takes away the conflict, he brings absolute flourishing between the people. But beforehand, there was no peace, right? There's no saving king, that's the Messiah, because they were estranged from Jesus Christ. They did not have a relationship with the Messiah, these Gentiles. They didn't have a people. They didn't belong to the people of God. They had no lasting possessions. All the covenant promises that came in through the promise of Abraham, the promise to David, and the new covenant promises that they would be changed from the inside out, that they would have the Holy Spirit, that that would be God's people, that they would be his new covenant people. Oh, they didn't have any of those promises. They had no bright future. They had no hope. And they had no welcome with God because they were without it. Right? So Paul lays out the landscape. This is very similar. Remember, he did this at at the beginning of chapter 2 when he said, this is who you used to be, and then here's what's happened to you personally. Now he's going to talk about, as a group of people, we used to be, to use Paul's phrase again from Titus, we used to be people who hated and were hating and were hated. Okay? We were hating people and we were hated. And the basic modus operandi outside of Christ is to use people to figure out how to advance ourselves through them, around them, over them, right? So the issue here is he's talking about that's who we used to be as Jews and Gentiles, as different races. We're hardwired in our fallenness to hate each other. Something dramatic has to happen to make us not only want to be with each other, but to actually positively move toward each other in love, right? Now, second thing then, what's God's answer? Verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Their alienation from God themselves and others has been overcome in Christ. Okay. Now this one I fought when I looked through the, made that little uh, study guide, which I hope you're still using, right? That little study guide. Um, uh, 210 was a great memory verse, but this one was the other one that I almost threw in in place of 210. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Okay? So our alienation from God, our alienations from our true identity, and especially from one another has been overcome in Christ. Right? You know, this is a, we, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult discussion to talk about what it means to love a given person. But it is true of every one of us who confess Christ that you have every resource and that God has literally moved heaven and earth to enable you to love your brother and sister in this auditorium. Right? And when we get to the point that we say, I can't love that person, I want you to think of it the other way, is that God has not provided me with enough resources to do this very hard task. So I'm saying this to Paul because he can barely put up with me, Paul Giroux, that you got resources, Paul. Right? No, I'm just teasing with him, right? But you know, you got, you got resources. Some, you know, have you, you ever heard this phrase in relationships? I've had it. I know none of you have ever said that, but people do say that. Right? I've had it. Sometimes they say it in here. Sometimes they say it out here. And you decide that's it. That's it. I absolve myself of caring for you, praying for you, caring about you, trying to reconcile with you, getting forgiveness from you. I can't, I can't, it's had it, right? Now, there's discussions to have about what it means to love people in difficult circumstances, but what he wants to say is that Christ died to make it possible for us all to be brought near to the foot of the cross together. Now, this last part then, God's work in Christ. I'm going to work through this quickly in our time here because I want to get to our sharing and application here he's going to go after what, what did God do to make this happen? This is pretty dramatic. How did he turn a group of people that hated each other right into people that are all standing at the foot of the cross, all belonging to one family through the work of Christ? Well, what did Christ do? What is that work that he did? So we're going to talk about what he did, why he did it, how do we know he did it, all right? And then he's going to talk about what this makes possible at the end. So all those things are happening here, and we'll see him as we work our way through, right? So... One, I just want to notice, this is, this is just an observation if you're looking at it. Jesus is at the center of everything. Right now, I've joked with you before that, you know, in our American culture, 
Uh, we like to think of ourselves as consumers, right? And you know, some of the basic principles are the consumer is always right, the customer is always right, and I'm here to be served, and I'm looking forward to you doing that as I walk in, right? And so many people, when they come to church, it's exactly the same way. You come to church and you say, okay, I'm here. Let's see how good a church you are by how you treat me. What Paul wants to say, okay, I'm in your church. I want to see what kind of church you are by how you treat Jesus. I want to see how central Jesus is to your life. I want to hear about him. I want to be pointed to him. Because I'm coming here as someone who's been redeemed by Christ, been resourced by Christ, and I'm coming in here to be a producer, not a consumer. I'm here with somebody that already has resources, so I'm not standing in judgment over this group of people. I'm coming here to participate in this group of people, and I'm on my knees if this group of people have lost their mission. And I should expect that I'm not the center of everything, right? You get the little imagery here? The world revolves around who? Jesus. This whole passage revolves around him. Apart from him, there's no hope. He's the center of it all, right? Not me, not my efforts, not the programming that we have at EBC. You know what makes our programs effective? People transformed by Jesus. You know what makes it powerful when Gray and, and Jack sings? It's, it's two musicians transformed by Jesus. Yes, they have talent. Yes, they have those things, but they're not submitted to and, and used to glorify Jesus. They're just clanging gongs. All that type of thing. Jesus is right at the center of it. And this whole, this whole paragraph, Jesus is right at the center. If he didn't accomplish it, we wouldn't do it. And so at the end, he is the reason why we're united because we all worship him. We'll come there right now. First thing then, right? What did he do? For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. So what did he do? Christ removed the barrier to peace, to harmony and human flourishing. If you're filling out your notes there, he removed that barrier. Well, it's the barrier on two levels. What existed between us and God because of our sin was God's wrath was on us. How did he bring peace? Well, he took that onto himself, right? He took God's wrath into himself by taking into him what we rightly deserve so that we didn't have to bear it. And so he made peace between us and God. The biblical term is reconciled us to him. So he did it on, on the horizontal level in his death. His death was the outworking of God's just wrath against our sin. And then when it came to relationships between Jews and Gentiles, in his new covenant, he took away the law as the prescription for how we live out that relationship with God in terms of its external markers. And now we all follow Jesus we all follow him. And there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile in terms of, uh, of uh, the people of God. So here we are within the people of God and the law is no longer, we don't observe kosher food laws. We don't observe certain f- feasts and festivals. There's nothing wrong with Jewish Christians observing those for themselves and their own heritage. But if they make them as something qual- uh, uh, necessary for a person to be a part of the body of Christ, no, 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 right? And so he broke that down. And now you've got this one group of people that come together as Jew and Gentile. What do they have to do to get in? Believe in Jesus. What extra? Nothing. Believe in Jesus. So he removed that barrier to peace. The second thing he did here, push the right button, uh, is why did he do it? His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So why did he do it? Christ did this to create his one new people. Okay? He did it for the purpose of making us his one new people, that we would be one family. Right? Not just that you could get your life cleaned up, right? Or that you could have good, you know, fire insurance in the future, which praise God for all those things. But he did it also to make a family, to create a group of people, right? Fourthly, keep moving on. How do we know that this is what Christ did? Because Christ came. He came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So Christ proclaimed this peace in his teaching and acts and through his words given to his apostles. Okay? So how do I know? Christ came to do that. 
That's exactly what he came to do. And he gave his word through his appointed representative, his apostles, to tell us the nature of why he came and what he went to accomplish. Okay? So I don't have to worry. Does Jesus really want me to be truly connected to a body of believers? Yes. Can I be faithful to God and not really be intricately involved with a body of believers? Let me just be straightforward and say no. But what if I'm just a member of the body of Christ, you know, in the city of Zenian? Well, I would say, well, who, who are your pastors? Who is the group of people that you're accountable to in terms of your life? Because the church is supposed to exercise discipline on its members. Who are your brothers and sisters that you're accountable to? Where are you serving, right? All those types of things. I want a person to come to know Jesus first and foremost, but there's no such thing as a believer who's not intimately connected with a group of people that is submitting to pastoral leadership, accountable to its body, and investing its gifts in a group of people that God has called them to. That's why, even though I go to Cedarville, which is a parachurch organization, that's not my church. It's not my church. Legacy is not your church. Athletes in Action is not your church. ISP and Campus Crusade is not your church, I'm telling Pastor Steve over there. All right? They're not your church. And that there's a difference between the two. Right? Cedarville is, is a gathering, for the most part, of 18 to 22-year-olds preparing for vocation and for vocational ministry. The church is not 18 to 22-year-olds preparing for vocation. Athletes in action, most of them over there are athletes. There's a lot of you in here that you're very glad that God doesn't only call athletes right into his kingdom, right? Because you've got three left feet, not two, but three, right? Um, you're one of those people that if they gave you the first pitch at a ball game, they would replay it over and over again because, you know, you would hurt yourself trying to throw it in or something like that, right? Uh, all that kind of stuff like that, right? It, it's not, those are not, ISP is trying to reach teachers all over the globe to, to impact right through that ministry. Well, the body of Christ is made up of a lot more people than teachers, Right? It's not child evangelism fellowship. There's a lot more ages and stages than CEF. It's not a legacy. It's not just training people. and, and it's, it's broader. It's, it's young and old. It's rich and poor. It's everyone that God invites to himself and says, this is my family. You make it work. Right? So he proclaimed that. And then finally, the issue here is he wants to say, well, what did this make possible? And this is something that I want to impress upon us is he makes it possible for God's presence to come among a group of people gathered together. Let me say two, two things. Paul will use the phrase of a temple and say, you individually are a temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6, if you want to look it up, right? What does it mean that, that God manifests his presence within your very self by virtue of the Spirit of God and declares you his own and empowers you and changes you, you are his dwelling place. But then back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, we collectively are God's temple. There's something that God wants to show about himself that can't happen just in you. It has to happen between us. It's hard to show the acceptance of one another the bearing of one another's burdens, the loving of one another, the honoring of one another, the caring for one another, the forgiving of one another, if there's no others. Right? How do we demonstrate the reality of a God who not just changes people, but he changes peoples? He wants to restore his, his creation. You can't do that by yourself. And we're... The, the body of Christ is going to push you in ways that you'll never be pushed on your own. Because you've got to step out from yourself and, and, and rub shoulders with people who don't think about everything the way you think about it. People who have different backgrounds, different messes, different struggles, right? different victories, different personalities. And God's saying, I did everything for you to make this family work. Don't bail out. Don't bail out. All right, so here's my, here's my takeaways. If you have them, here's my shareable ones, right? The ones that I, I would say here. Okay, and there's so many things we could say about this, and our time is coming to close, right? I'm taking us back to the very beginning of the book. 
the all-good, all-wise, all-powerful Father. Right? Now, I, I just want to say this right now. When we come together as the people of God, and because I, I run to Christians like this right, all the time, Okay, sometimes at Cedarville, I'll have a, a young student who'll come to me and they'll get among the people who profess Christ at Cedarville and they'll sit down in my office and go, Dr. Cows, I can't take it. I'm saying, well, what's wrong? Oh, there's so many hypocrites here. And I said, so, yeah? Well, aren't you bothered by that? Well, well sure I am. But why are you surprised? Are, are you, why, why did you expect everybody was perfect here? You think everybody had their act together? That tells me two things. One, you're, you're really naive. And, and number two, you probably don't have a good self-assessment. You probably don't have a good self-assessment of yourself. You probably really don't understand just how flawed and broken you are. And you're standing above everybody and telling them, I just wish they would all come up to my level. Right? That's not the heart of Jesus, right? Because th there's brokenness all over this room, right, at different places. And, and Christian growth is often like a bar chart. You'll find somebody who's really mature over here, and then they get in this area, like their social media, and you're going, what happened to them? Over here, they're just so calm and collected, and they get on, the, on social media, and it's like all the filters leave them. Where are, what, what, hey, hello, hello, where, where are you, right? Or you find somebody in one area, they're compassionate and forgiving, and then when it comes to their finances, they've never, spent, they've never got a check that they couldn't spend more than they got. And they're in trouble, and they don't manage their finances well. And you go, well, wait a minute, C could you bring those two together? And when you get Christians alongside of each other, they're often, the place where you're strong is where they're often weak. And, and, and you can compliment one another, or you can try to, you know, elevate yourself over them on that little scale, Right? So, but this is what we find all the time. And, and some of you are in a really good place today. Some of you had a really crappy week spiritually. Some of you had a good week spiritually, right? Well, we're coming in together and we're asking God to recalibrate us all, right? All those kind of things. Like, so I have those things. So, but the all good, all wise, all powerful God, yes, he's the one that designed this crazy mess that we're in. It's his design, and if we say, no, 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 I don't want the crazy mess. I just want the group that's just like me. God, I just don't think you're very wise because it works a lot better if I have people who love exactly what I love. And when I got to put up with these other people, it's too much stress. I just want to hang out with people that are more like me. And God, I don't think that's really wise. Why don't you have a homogeneous group? Okay. So the all-good, all-powerful Father has made a way to replace hatred between individuals and people groups with love. Now notice, these are active postures, not hatred with, okay, I'll put up with them. No, hatred, I really, I really want their best. And I'm going to pray for it and agitate for it, right? Second one, the all-good, all-wise, all-powerful Father makes it clear that the underlying cause of the hostility between people and people groups is rooted in their hostility toward God. This is why there is no politician, there is no advocacy group that can ever uh, address the deep hostilities between any given group of people and another group of people because it's ultimately rooted in the distorted view of themselves. It's rooted in their rebellion against God. Right? The answer, truly, right? Uh, you know, when you were little and you were in Sunday school, right, what was the right answer to every question? Jesus, right? Even sometimes they would ask your name and you would go, Jesus. No, 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 I'm asking your name, right? But truly, as an adult, the answer is Jesus. Seriously, it's Jesus. And we need him. So the cause, it's rooted in God. And so the reason why, and this is what gets, the reason why you're not getting along with brother or sister here, and you're not able to dis distinguish between something you really should be upset about from something that's your preference or a conviction is really at the bottom of it. And this is hard. It's sinful. And it's immaturity. Right? I'm, I'm guilty of it. I'm not speaking to you guys. I'm guilty of it. Right? So here, to encourage divisions in the body of Christ is to sin whether that be by passively disengaging or by actively driving wedges between people or groups within the body of Christ. Okay? Now, you can passively disengage, right? People just kind of disappear. They just stay out of each other's lives. You know, we all know how to do this, right? We all know how to be friendly without caring about people. 
right? You, be, I can walk around through a group of people. I can walk up to Jake and talk about, you know, things that, are, that we would talk about as human beings, right? I can talk about, ask him about his job. I can do these things like that. But I know in my own heart, I'm steering the conversation. I just don't want to get to really know Jake because as I really get to know him, I know who are going to disagree over certain things. And maybe I heard from somebody else that Jake is different from me on this issue, like vaccinations, or he's different from me on politics in some area, or he's different from me on sports team, which is probably more important than all the rest of them, right? Or he's different me from whatever. And so I just avoid that instead of moving in, having a conversation with him because I want to steer the relationship that I really don't want to get to know him. I just want to look like I'm a friendly person. And if we're called to be a family, you're going to figure out that not everybody agrees with you on everything in this room. And if they do, they're lying. If they do, I'm going to say they're lying. I say this to couples all the time. When you come together and you've got one party in the relationship that never disagrees, that always goes along, it simply means that they're either being bullied by their partner or they're not secure enough to give their own opinions. Nobody agrees with everybody on everything. All right? So if you're going to get that, but we can passively disengage. Then finally, in looking to maintain, deepen, or restore relationships in the body of Christ, we should look to God's directions for how we should think of ourselves and respond to each other. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm an avid, uh, I'm avidly engaged in the political arena, right? I'm, I'm listening to things on my podcast, things that I'm listening to. Some of you, I picked them out. You would know who I'm listening to, right? So I listen to Ben Shapiro. And anybody who knows Ben Shapiro, he's not a believer. He's an Orthodox Jew. And I listen to him. He's very politically involved. I listen to a guy by the name of Andrew Claven, who is a Christian. He's a mere Christianity Christian, if you will. Has some funky ideas about the Bible, but has some deep wisdom. And he's an a, a, a artist and a playwright. And I listen to him on a regular basis. Uh, I, 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 I survey news sites that I have in front of me. Right? I read... And I, I forgot to bring it up here with me, oh, and because I, I was going to recommend it. I'm very, very, very interested in social justice issues because of their impact. And I just finished reading this book right here, Confronting Injustice Without Compromising Truth by uh, Thaddeus Williams. And I read through it, marked it all up. I think it's one of the best books I've read. And I recommend it to you. It's very consumable, Right? And so I'm inviting all that chaos into my mind because I'm very concerned about black-white relationships. I'm very concerned about the unity of our church. I'm very concerned about how politics is penetrating the walls of EBC. I'm very concerned about all these types of things because I'm concerned about my family. I'm concerned about the mission of Jesus. I'm concerned about us following him faithfully in this moment. I'm concerned. And I'm, I'm not calling us to some surface level engagement with each other so that we avoid all the hot topics. No, I'm calling us to re be reminded of our identity and push into each other and be honest with each other about what we believe. But at the end of the day, it is sinful to let any external identity determine your relationship to a person in this room. Any external identity, if you put Black Lives Matter before your, your, your uh, identity in Christ, that is sinful. If you put Republic before your, I, Republican before your identity in Christ, that is sinful. If you put any cause before that in such a way that now you can't talk to another brother or sister in Christ that Christ has united you with, that is the evil one at work. We need conversations over these issues. Some of us need to understand viewpoints that are different than ours. Some of us, but we need to trust each other to have those. And if we shut each other down and we move out, we'll just, we'll just walk somewhere else. We'll live on the surface of things. We'll have conversations with our little subgroups about the other subgroups that are in here. No, no, no. So I, I just want to say, I want to say to you, this is a moment where stress is strain. We need to be reminded that we're followers of Jesus. We need to be reminded that he tells us who we are. We need to be reminded this, that the real mission is not to bring some sort of pseudo-justice through some legal activity. It's to bring true justice by writing people with God where the real injustice in life is, is that God is not getting his due. 
That's the real injustice, and it's the source of all other injustices. And if we lose our identity, we lose our mission, well, then we, let's just be swept up in some other group. We are his redemptive agents, and we need to work those things out. If unity can't happen here, it can't happen anywhere. That's the claim. Right? Now, I'm not speaking to you as a, there's a bunch of burning things that are going on. I'm just saying the pressures are so great that things are happening so often, right? I even know Pastor Van was talking about here where he just had to take a week out of it, right? Was that, was that what you told me, Pastor Van, where he just said, I got to turn it all off for a while? Because it just blows your mind what's going on. It's like every day is a new crisis. And pretty soon you've forgotten who you are, what really matters, and we're no longer caring for each other. So God help us. Would you stand with me? I'm taking us right to the end. And I just want to say to you here that we all who were f- far away from God, right? And I've said this to you before. If God is for you, it doesn't make any difference who's against you. But if God isn't on your side, it doesn't make any difference who is. You were once far from him. You were in the worst place possible. Now, because of the work of Christ, you've been brought near. And there are real bonds between us in this room, right? There are real bonds between us, real bonds that have been forged by Christ. I often say this to married couples when they're standing there, that when, when, when uh, what Jesus talks about marriage, he says what, what God has joined together, right? Well, he's joined us all together. He's made us brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't care if you don't feel like one today. I don't care if you're aggravated at somebody else today. It's shame on us if we've made you feel like you're not a brother or sister. You are. God calls us to make it work. Over our sin, over our fears, over our particular convictions and preferences, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? I love my family. I love my family. I love the people in this room. Uh, many of you I know, and I've had lots of conversations with over time. I pray for you. Right? What's, what just saved my soul on Monday was praying for all of you. I pray for your growth. So God, help us to be his people. Pray with me, will you? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your kindness as to us. Lord, we know we are a people who are just so needy. But Lord, this, what this reminds us is that you are actively working. Lord, just, it's not that you've done something, but you've given us your spirit. You've made us new people. And you're actively building us up into a dwelling place where you, where your, your, your character, your power is manifest, Lord, as your presence is with us. Lord, give us a sense of anticipation about gathering together. Lord, that we're coming together and there's something that you want to do that can only happen when we're together, that it can't even happen when I'm by myself. Lord, that you want me as I relate to my brothers and sisters here to sense the depth of the change that you've happened because people that we used to be enemies with, people that it used to be uh, people that we wanted to use or people that we hid from, now you want us to treat each other as brothers and sisters. Lord, please give us the strength. Protect us, Lord. We know the evil one is at work trying to divide us. We know the evil one is at work trying to distract us from our identity, distract us and, and, and to diminish your power and your wisdom. And so, Lord, help us, we pray. May it be true that people come in and they, they recognize as they talk to people that not everybody agrees on everything. But this group of people, they love each other. Lord, may that be true of us. And we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As you go out, love somebody, right? Talk to somebody, greet them as your brother or sister, figure out what's going on in their life. And if God's poking at you to talk to somebody, you got a barrier between, well, make a plan and do it. God bless you. Have a good day.